Priyal Agarwal, a machine learning engineer at Snorkel AI, and we just had an incredible mindful research with Kajla. If you missed it, she will be offering another session tomorrow at the same time. And if you're just joining us, we have organized our event into three tracks filled with some amazing talks, the data track, the techniques track, and the applications track. And you're currently in the techniques track. To join sessions in other tracks, navigate to agenda right above the stage and select the track that you wish to join and enter the session. You can also see the agenda in a grid view uh, by going to the chat and then docs or visiting the Snorkel virtual booth. Before we dive into our next talk, I would like to remind everyone about the community polls that we will be having throughout the day. Throughout the day, we'll offer three different community poll questions for you to weigh in on, and we will aggregate all your responses and share insights from these polls in the Snorkel AI booth, so you can see trends amongst your peers in the industry. We have a live poll right now. Uh, to participate, please navigate to the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click the poll button. Um, Thank you so much for voting, and please make sure to visit the Snorkel booth to see the results. Awesome. Now, please join me in welcoming to this stage our session moderator for the panel discussion about exploring new frontiers of weak supervision, senior applied scientist at Snorkel AI, Faye Poms. Hi, Faye. Hey, hey, how's it going? Thanks for the introduction. Of course, um, so excited for your panel session and the stage is all yours. Great. Yeah, well, as, as Priyal said, my name is Faye um, and I am a senior applied research scientist here at Snorkel AI. And I'll be the moderator for this session today. We have a very exciting panel on exploring new frontiers for weak supervision. Weak supervision is one of the core technologies behind Snorkel Flow. So we're really excited to talk about all the new research that's going on here. For those who aren't familiar, a very brief description of weak supervision and the idea behind it is essentially that we can aggregate labels, domain knowledge, other forms of supervision in the form of labeling functions to rapidly generate training sets with much lower human effort than something like manual annotation. So before we get started, um, I'd like you all to meet our panelists who are professors and researchers working on state-of-the-art research around weak supervision. Um, if our panelists could uh, join right now, that'd be great. Great, so maybe we'll start with um, Fred. Fred, would you like to introduce yourself uh, to the panel or to, to the session? Yeah. yeah, thanks so much, Faye, and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, my name is Fred Sala. I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I'm also a research scientist at Snorkel AI, and I believe just like all three panelists, I got involved with Snorkel and weak supervision um, back as a postdoc at Stanford. So my research interests are very broadly in data efficient machine learning. And I'm very excited about all flavors of weak supervision. Just some of the work that I'm super interested lately is how to automate the weak supervision pipeline and how to work with all sorts of modalities and tasks and make weak supervision compatible with that. Great, thanks, thanks Fred. Um, Steve, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Steve Bach. I'm an assistant professor at Brown University in the computer science department. And I'm also a research scientist at Snorkel. And uh, in my research interests are around the ways that we teach computers what we want them to do. And particularly, how can we improve that process, make it more efficient, more effective for, for users. So definitely programmatic weak supervision is, is incredibly important in this space. I'm also increasingly interested in things like zero shot learning and the way that that connects to um, other aspects of, of weak supervision. And hopefully we'll talk more about that today. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah. Uh, Jason, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Faye. Um, I'm Jason Fries. I'm a computer scientist, research scientist at Stanford University in the Center for Biomedical Informatics Research, and I'm also a researcher at uh, Snorkel AI. Um, my research is really at the intersection of machine learning and medicine, and I'm particularly interested in accelerating subject matter experts like clinicians and their ability to build and maintain and interrogate machine learning models built over very complicated data streams, such as the electronic health record. And what this in practice turns out to be is uh, mostly working in multimodal representation learning and increasingly few and in zero shot learning, which I, again, as Steve said, we'll probably talk about. So. 
Great. Um, awesome. Yeah. So before we sort of dive in, I just wanted to say uh, if, you, if anyone has any questions um, for the panelists, the format today is basically we're going to go through some um, some topics of interest um, that I've, I've prepared. But along the way, if anyone has any questions that we want to um, ha they have for the panelists, um, feel free to post those in the chat or in the Q&A and I will sort of pull those up or toward the end, we'll have maybe a couple minutes reserved for just answering um, audience questions. So that's sort of the, the format. Um, but yeah, so to kick things off, um, I wanted to start by talking about one of the most, I would say, exciting recent developments that's driving many of the new frontiers for weak supervision. And that's the sort of proliferation of these large language models or also called foundation models. Um, and, and these large language models, they've sort of already started to radically change the landscape for things like NLP and also for computer vision more broadly and also within the context of, of weak supervision. And um, I know, uh, for example, Jason here, you, you've done a bunch of work in this area as, as long as, as well as others here. Um, would you mind giving us sort of a quick introduction to kind of the large language models and sort of how they're kind of playing out in the weak supervision space as you see it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you said, like large language models, you know, initially GPT-3 and OpenAI really captured the imagination. And these are massive machine learning models involving billions of learned parameters trained to generate. And what this is opened up is a lot of new ways to think about interacting with machine learning models uh, using often the scale is very exciting because these models end up acquiring quite a And as it seems as scale increases, uh, these continue to perform better and demonstrate emerging properties where their ability to um, sort of reason and handle classification tasks may have directly been seems to continue to improve. So while that's a, the scale is actually a problem as well, because Training these language models um, is extremely compute intensive, intensive, and that really narrows the um, field of folks who can plausibly train these models. And that actually, that um, sort of challenge is one of the big motivations of an international effort, big science, to research large language models that, that both Steve and I were involved in various projects that's been, uh, was a primary research contribution uh, was a large, Free scale open language model. Boom. So we see like this great trend towards you know some amount of opening up of the model itself to a community, but it doesn't these sort of practical challenges that we want to address um, with this is which how do we use these models to handle the problems we really want to use? And between the sort of general purpose knowledge they have, they're they're quite difficult to steer handle very specific problems. And then when coupled with the scale, they're very expensive for inference. So in practice, not much as a model you could imagine deploying. And this is where uh, a lot of opportunity of weak supervision comes to play and becomes very exciting because we can start thinking about ways that we can extract this information we want or the script to the very specific problems we want to do, but accelerates our ability to, uh, for domain experts to inject information by taking advantage of all the general knowledge these models have acquired. So you can think of this as, you know, uh, a weak supervision from what the model knows to train a new model that is um, sort of a weak supervision, a guided model distillation that generates models that, you know, potentially are more servable and usable in practice. And this is a, you know, a really exciting area that, that I'm sure others on the channel will talk about, um, but it's it's opened up a lot of excitement on how to use these foundation models in, in practice for weak supervision. <clears throat> yeah, abs absolutely. Um, uh, I think sort of one of the uh, really sort of exciting ways in which I've seen these sort of foundation models coming up is they, they sort of start, uh, allowed us to start looking at things like multimodal integration, where because we're working with these foundation models, which are incorporating um, a lot of uh, sort of disparate sources of data, we can start to look at most sort of multimodal problems, and in particular, new the problem domains that sort of open up as a result of that. Um, 
so yeah, I, I know both you, both you, Jason, but also Fred have sort of published quite a big bit of work on trying to use multimodal in the context of foundation models and, and also otherwise. Um, do you mind sort of giving us a rundown of sort of how how these foundation models have started to kind of open up new problem areas or sort of what the kind of uh, sort of new developments in that space have been as a result? Uh, Fred, I think you're muted, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks Faye, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, to me, I'm really excited about using weak supervision for very diverse applications and tasks. And kind of the way I see that question is to break it down into sort of two facets, one of which is kind of changing the output. Um, as we described, and as Jason referred to, we've been doing weak supervision for classification type problems for quite a while, and we've been very successful there. Um, but we'd also like to expand it to all kinds of other potential problem domains as well. Um, and that's some, something I'm very interested in. And there's also really nice research in that direction, kind of at the frontier of what we can do in weak supervision. Um, so one of those sort of interesting things that we could do is to expand weak supervision to things like regression, so making continuous predictions, um, producing ordered lists the way we would in recommendation systems, um, and then other things like just generating structured output. So for example, in segmentation, we have this very complex segmentation mass that we have to produce. Um, so new techniques for making weak supervision work for all of these diverse tasks in terms of what kind of output we produce it's something that I'm very excited by, and there's been a lot of really interesting recent work in that direction. The other interesting direction, and it's just what you referred to, Faye, is being able to handle more diverse data at the input. Um, and this is something where we started off being very successful in kind of naturally applying weak supervision to text problems, just because it's very easy to write these programmatic labeling functions for text initially. But since then, we've been able to expand to all kinds of other types of modalities that people would like to work with. So images, video, audio, relational data, for example. And all of these things get a bit trickier just because if you get raw signals for these modalities, it tends to be more difficult to kind of produce weak supervision or weak information about them directly. And the way we've handled that and the way folks typically do so is by introducing these primitives um, but finding a good primitive to work over for images and, for example, for audio is often challenging. And this is a place where foundation models, as you refer to, are actually extremely helpful for producing these kinds of primitives that make it very easy to work over. It's not a fully solved problem. And some of the research I'm really kind of excited by is being able to automatically discover what are the exact right primitives for us to build labeling functions over. Um, the other kind of very interesting thing here is multimodality. And I, I think Jason is going to speak about this more because his work really touches on this. Um, when we think of multimodal models and machine learning, it's often a challenge, right? You're adding this additional complexity. For weak supervision, it's actually often a benefit, though, uh, because by accessing multiple modalities, you get to borrow signal from any of these modalities and even borrow primitives from whatever is kind of the easiest modality to work over and apply them to everything else. Um, so I do think that multimodal data is this kind of super exciting area that weak supervision in particular um, benefits from. But I'll, I'll let Jason speak more because he's actually used a lot of these tools in his own research to do super exciting stuff. Great, thanks, Fred. Can you guys hear me? I had some uh, technical issues previously, so hopefully I'm better now. Yeah, so I, uh, like, like a, a thousand percent, uh, you know, what Fred said about multimodality and sort of the challenges therein. So like in healthcare, when, when people say like the electronic health record, they talk about it like it's a gestalt singular thing, but it's actually this vast complicated collection of multimodal data streams at different temporal granularity, a mix of structured and heavily unstructured data. And these are all the elements that a, a clinician interacts with to make decisions and describe phenomenon about human health. So that idea of borrowing primitives, you know, we, you know, I've mostly worked in clinical texts for all the reasons that Fred highlighted, but they are describing these useful concepts for domain experts to convey information and convey state, but as exist in these multimodal data streams. And just by the 
difficulties in building ML models in complex domains like medicine, it's very challenging to build ML models on these multimodal data streams because we just can't scale to foundation model levels with, the, with manual labeling. But we have this huge resource of weak and, you know, weak and strong label data from the execution of doctors' daily interactions with patients. So that ability to think about, you know, combining all of this signal in some model that has some notion of a language or a domain set of primitives is extremely exciting as we think about the next generation version of weak supervision. Now we can really empower people like doctors or really any domain expert that interacts with a very complicated view of reality, um, how we can really enable them to express their expertise more efficiently to build models. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think one of the most exciting things about sort of the, this collision of foundation models and sort of weak supervision is that with foundation models, we get all of this really interesting kind of prior knowledge, all of this sort of um, <clears throat> information that's gleaned from data sources that are so much larger than any individual problem. But we can bring those to bear using weak supervision by taking parts of those foundation models and sort of adapting them using things like labeling functions to be able to then benefit sort of downstream problems while still taking advantage of things like ha hand labels or even sort of expert domain knowledge that maybe a doctor or some other kind of, you know, subject matter expert has. So I think that, yeah, that that's, I think, going to show so much um, change and sort of new potential in, in context of weak supervision. I think that, like like you said, Jason, sort of next, next generation or second generation of weak supervision is a really good term for that. Um, yeah, so sort of kind of on, on that point, um, looking sort of a little bit further into the future, um, past kind of, you know, I would say sort of where foundation models sort of have been, um, there's just a lot of new interest around um, sort of prompting, which is sort of a new way to adapt, as I was saying, adapt these kind of large language models to a part, particular sort of target problem domain. Um, I know, Steve, for example, you've been really interested in this and have done a bunch of a bunch of work here. Um, do you mind giving us a short, short introduction to what is prompting? Why is it exciting? Kind of, you know, what? how is this going to change weak supervision or, or play into that, that area? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, Faye, uh, excuse me. Um, I do, do think that prompting is going to be a, a key component of, of that next generation of weak supervision systems. And uh, what prompting is, is it's a way of interacting with these foundation models that have a language component to them. So whether it's a, a large language model like GPT-3 or maybe a vision language model like CLIP, the idea of prompting is that we're going to express what we want the model to do as a task. Uh, excuse me, it, 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 we want it to do um, in terms of natural language, the task we want it to do. So. If, for example, I want to get GPT-3 or some other large language model to solve a problem for me, maybe what I'll say is I'll actually add, like put the input to that language model in terms of a question like, what topic is this news article about? And then use its ability to predict what the likely following word is as a prediction, as actually um, a signal about what the answer is for that, for that task. Um, and this is a little bit different from the way that we've done um, deep learning or machine learning more generally, um, even a few years ago, where we learn things like weight vectors for classification, where we say, okay, I'm going to learn a, a vector that represents the true label, and I'm going to learn one that represents the, the false label or whatever. Instead, I'm going to use language as this interface. Um, so that's prompting in a, in, a, in a very small nutshell, but I think it's going to impact weak supervision very substantially because it's a, a way, it's like an interface to access that, that domain knowledge that you were just talking about, Faye, that, that the foundation models have acquired so much information from their pre-training. Prompting is a way to query that knowledge and, um, and apply it to, to new problems. Uh, and we're really excited about this because it seems to um, really complement weak supervision well. So um, uh, Jason and some other folks and I have uh, recently posted uh, a preprint on Archive about some of the work that we've done at Snorkel 
exploring this. And the idea is that we can actually use prompting to create labeling functions in weak supervision systems. So let's say I want to do something like spam classification. Well, I could just say, is the following message spam? Or I could ask it, I could, I could come up with other prompts like, does this, does this message ask the reader to do something? Does this message talk about prescription drugs, for example, if it's email spam? All of these different signals that we can, uh, as subject matter experts, know about but might have trouble expressing in, um, in code, in, uh, in, in sort of those primitives that Fred was talking about. Prompting gives us a, another another language to construct these um, these these sources of supervision, and uh, we you know we're really excited because the preliminary results suggest that that there's there's an opportunity for kind of a best of both worlds thing here that that the that the foundation model has lots and lots of um, domain knowledge, but as Jason mentioned, it can be hard to steer them. So that so the, using the tools of weak supervision, we can add some control on what the the model is is uh, doing by creating multiple labeling functions by adding a, a, a bit of fault tolerance. So one, you know, labeling function can fix the mistakes of the others. Um, and so I think that this is going to be a really big um, uh, area, and we're you know we're we're starting to to um, explore these techniques. <clears throat> Right, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I was also sort of working on some of the, uh, working with some of the prompting uh, work actually with, with some of the customers and it was really um, kind of shocking to see how <clears throat> how far you could, how, how um, precise of a model you could produce given sort of natural language prompts as a way to kind of um, generate these labeling functions, which before had to be generated almost purely out of, um, primitives or sort of lower level um, handwritten code. Um, do you, I mean, one of the things that, that I found really exciting about um, prompting based models is that unlike um, sort of weak supervision as it has been, um, where, you know, the, in addition to writing the labeling functions or the domain expert has to actually sort of define at least some basic primitives or or work with something uh, maybe a little bit sort of uh, lower level, like the actual text components. But one of the really exciting things about prompting is that it's not just a sort of new type of um, like labeling function that you can operate on a, on a defined set of primitives, but actually is sort of this all-in-one um, large sort of massive set of primitives that are being kind of uh, selected based upon the, the on the text queries. Um, and one way I know that this has sort of um, potentially been quite interesting is in domains where the um, the problem that you're working on, the sort of task that you're trying to produce a model for, is quite different from sort of what's commonly out there, right? Like if you look at something like what the foundation models of these large language models were trained on, and then you look at the sort of problem, the target problem domain you're looking at, when those have a lot of differences, just using something like a foundation model by itself can be, can it may, it may not generalize to that domain. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on sort of how on sort of how prompting and in particular these large language models play into adapting to these new domains, which is where honestly most I think most customer problems are going to fall into because they're not going to be whatever is available broadly on the internet. There's some, they're going to be a very particular target domain where there's a lot of interesting nuance and sort of um, details to them that. You wouldn't necessarily the large language model isn't necessarily going to know about um yeah do you have any thoughts there yeah absolutely and i I'm, I'm sure fred and jason do as well but um in terms of adaptability exactly what you said that like these foundation models are so big that even the ways that we're used to adapting models uh through things like transfer learning it's not exactly a solved problem with these foundation models and so one of the, in, in the sense that they're very computationally expensive if you want to fine tune all of their parameters. And it's hard, it, it can be potentially hard to teach it new things without causing it to forget what it already knew. That's, that's kind of a big, that's one of the big problems in adapting these models. Um, and so one of the, another interesting trend within prompting is actually learning 
new words or expanding the vocabulary of the model. This is something that we've been interested in um, in our in our group at, at Brown particularly is um, how do you teach the model new words? And it, it's, it turns out that prompting can be the interface for learning new concepts as well. And so without getting into too many of the technical details, the idea is basically to fine tune just your vocabulary for new domains. And this can lead you to actually, um, you know, expand those set of primitives. You can actually create new, new primitives for, um, you know, your domain. Uh, and I think that's going to be another um, mechanism by which people um, adapt foundation models to the, 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 you know, wide spectrum of domains that are out there. Right. Um, and I'm sure this also comes up in, in sort of healthcare applications too, right, Jason? I mean, I've done a little bit of work there. I, I don't, I'm obviously not an expert, but I know that for those domains, right, the, the type of data you're looking at is so different from what's out there, what these large language models are typically being trained on, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the it's a significant limitation just based on the, the vast amount of technical language, the vast different forms, the things like clinical notes take, they just do not look like the types of things you encounter on the web often, or even how people you know, normally talk if you're not a doctor or, or like a bio person. And so like, this is a challenge and, and like where to fix it, like as Steve said, if there's ways to fix like an existing giant model, or if we're sort of on the hook to, you know, bake this in from the get go is the, the legitimate research questions on what route to go. But it sort of at the end falls down to the data and one challenge that like uh, that, that emerged out of the big science work that again both Steve and I were involved with was sort of remedying what, what we've called data set debt in biomedical applications is that they just you have great initiatives out of hugging face to make data available at scale to integrate into to foundation model training but biomed has sort of never crossed that hump to, to be available so we have a big initiative called Big Bio where we did a huge effort to take data centric ideas about curation and management of data to bring in a bunch of domain specific knowledge from language in biomedicine with the hope of doing a better job in some way of adapting or training these foundation models for, for healthcare and, and biomedical in general. And so I think there's, it's, it's a wide open road for what to do there, but um, you know, this initial steps are, are underway, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, um, it, it seems like we actually have a question from um, the panel or sorry, from the audience, which we will just go quickly over and then I think we'll probably have to wrap up. But um, yeah, so Ryan asks, can prompting be effective with tabular data that is non NLP related? What would be an example? I think probably, Fred, you have uh, the answer to this question. Yeah, yeah. So. This is actually a pretty challenging question because it's known that a lot of deep learning methods sometimes struggle with tabular data, um, whereas more classical machine learning techniques still do quite well. Um, I think the answer is that, yes, it's possible for prompting-based techniques and foundation models to actually give you some additional benefit even on this kind of data. Um, but the challenge is how to extract the right information from there. Um, and one of the fun things, just like we've been chatting about, is basically the weak supervision and framework fits as a nice layer on top of what's in these foundation models that helps you kind of control or kind of extract the right insights and really be able to use that for your benefit on these kinds of diverse data tasks like tabular data, which you can't quite easily do if you just kind of go ahead and let it do a zero shot kind of prediction without doing anything else. So yes, uh, I'm very optimistic about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. That was such an amazing panel session. I personally learned so much about like the cutting edge research on weak supervision and how it ties with the foundation models, especially. Uh, thanks, Faye, for moderating the session. And thanks, uh, Steve, Fred, Jason, all of you. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, look out um, for future versions of CircleFlow for maybe some of the ideas actually coming to bear in practice. So. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Thank you.
Awesome. Uh, if you all could take a quick second to tell us how the session went, we would really appreciate it. Again, go to the polls tab located in the upper right hand of the screen. And up next, uh, in the techniques track, we have a talk about real-time machine learning uh, by the CEO and co-founder of Claypot AI, Chip Huen. And I will see you all there. <laughs>